success story. An on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the greater San Francisco Bay Area is brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield, makers of Rich Lube HD motor oil and Richfield gasolines. For every type of machine in every industry, there's a scientific Richfield lubricant. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Hartley Sater, narrator for these weekly Richfield success stories. What you're seeing is actually the sound of my voice as it reaches you through your television set. The electronic device that is letting you see what is known as the audio or sound portion of this program is called an oscilloscope. They are standard equipment in every television station and, of course, part of the equipment for these success story telecasts. The jagged, moving lines are the variations of current actuated by the tone and volume of my voice as I now speak to you. Except that you'll notice that while I've actually stopped speaking, my voice continues. How come? Because while I've been pretending to speak to you by moving my lips, my voice has actually been coming to you from one of the world's most astonishing and versatile devices, an Ampex tape recorder. And the mention of this world-renowned device comes the clue to the location of our success story cameras tonight. In a sense, it promises to look behind the scenes, not only of our most modern today, but of the electronic world of tomorrow in this visit to the Ampex Corporation plants in Redwood City, California. At the outset, we should confess that when we first visited this Ampex plant, we expected to see only the familiar, cherished Ampex home tape recording machines with which so many families make permanent records of events, radio music, and even the voices of their own children. Little did we anticipate learning of devices which can and do record as many as 28 separate soundtracks simultaneously, providing a tape record of flight peculiarities and other vital data of rockets as they pierce outer space or to other Ampex equipment that again, by recording up to 28 separate soundtracks instantaneously on a single tape, have actually located valuable oil deposits, the various data being correlated through seismographic impulses resulting from underground explosive charges. During our weekly success stories, we've shown you many intricate mechanical devices, usually operated by human hands. But here is a complex machine operated by an Ampex tape recorder. Originally, specifications from a blueprint were fed into a computer, which then translated them into dimensional requirements for a machine tool in the form of electrical impulses, which in turn were recorded on magnetic tape. By playing the tape as many times as required, the machine turns out any number of high-precision parts without any human help. Elsewhere in the great and secret United States Missile Center tests, a technician counts off the seconds before a giant guided missile will rise into outer space. Meanwhile, the reels on a battery of Ampex tape recorders begin to turn. And there she goes, rising like a meteor from its station, accelerating from nothing to incredible speed within the first hundred feet of flight. Now every detail, every peculiarity of its course must be faithfully, accurately, and permanently recorded, because this one missile may have cost a quarter of a million dollars. Within it are sensitive devices designed to send out impulses revealing temperature, pressures, velocity, acceleration, rate of fuel consumption, and innumerable other data. These impulses are automatically radioed back to Earth and recorded by Ampex tape recorders. By playing the tapes into computers, a complete analysis of the missile's flight is produced in an incredibly short time, literally reflying the missile over and over again on tape. But to get a fuller explanation of how Ampex recording equipment relates to these dramatic scenes, Let's return to our master of ceremonies, Bob Day, as we discover him with Bob Sackler, manager of Ampex Instrumentation Division. Uh, what we've seen has been very thrilling and very interesting, Mr. Sackler. If the, if the viewers are in the same position that I'm in, they are still a little bit doubtful about exactly what part an Ampex tape recorder plays in the guided missile field. Well, Bob, uh, here is a picture showing the test flight of a guided missile. The flight itself may last from or from several minutes down to several seconds. If something happens during the launching, for example, the rocket may, or the missile may just um, uh, keel over. Now, just uh, previous to the um, launching period, and all during the flight, the, the rocket is radioing down information to the various ground stations. 
This information is, uh, is taken and a recording is made on NAMPEX uh, uh, units such as you have seen here previously. Well, let's look at this. The information, obviously, is not spoken. It's code. Oh, no. It's a, it's, it's a form of um, radio code. Well, now, you've shown three different receiving stations here. What's the purpose of that? Well, uh, of course, the uh, missile flight may be several hundred miles in uh, length. Now, uh, during the course of the flight, the uh, small radio may get out of range of one of the ground stations and is picked up by the second and then the third station. Uh, thus, we always have a, a radio station that can, um, that can hear the um, uh, radio of the, of the rocket itself. Mm -hmm. And then those tapes are pieced together to get one continuous tape? Right. Well, then it seems to me that by playing that tape in the laboratory, they could actually recreate the flight of the missile. That is, that is right, Bob. And that, of course, would affect a tremendous saving to, to the government. Well, now, what sort of information would it send down? Oh, it would send down uh, such things as the temperature of the skin of the rocket, the fuel consumption, the speed of the rocket itself, and uh, many other data factors. Thank you very much, Mr. Sackman. I think that clears that up pretty well. Opens a view of a very fantastic future, as well as quite a startling present. But speaking uh, along those lines, we've done some research into the past of sound recording, and Hartley Sayers is going to talk about that now. The history of sound recording. Oddly enough, the theory of magnetic tape was discussed even before the advent of this familiar antique, an authentic Edison phonograph, first patented in 1896. It still plays. Listen. Well, we can hardly call that hi-fi. Nevertheless, Thomas A. Edison, among countless other firsts, had given the world its first groove-cut records, on which the vibrations of a stylus or cutting head actually cut high or low frequencies against the sides of each groove, actuated by volume of sound. Then came an improvement. A man named Berliner believed that a flat disc record would provide longer playing as well as sound advantages in the recording field. His theory proved ultimately correct and established the trend to this type of disc. Although early examples were about a quarter of an inch in thickness, Berliner was responsible for development of the famed Victor Record Company and this trademark so well remembered by the older generation. To this day, untold millions of record collectors of the flat disc type probably are unaware of the steps which must be gone through before the copy in their possession could be marketed. Let's follow those several steps. First, there's the acetate matrix which originally was often composed of hardened beeswax up to an inch and a half thick. From this, after the original grooves were cut, was developed a master disc, and a copper-plated mother disc was copied from the master. The next step was to produce another copper-plated disc called the stamper, from which, as the word implies, copies for playing could be stamped out into the millions. Substantially, whether you prefer LP or other type recordings, these same processes are followed in producing them. But today, the most modern and improved forward step in sound reproduction is in Ampex tape recording. Whether in industry, the home, for record reproduction, or in theater, for Ampex, stereophonic sound is becoming standard. Stereophonic simply meaning sound in three audible dimensions. Sound with actual direction, depth, and the utmost fidelity. And yet even though most of us are familiar with the words tape recording, how many really do understand what is meant by magnetic tape? Do you, Bob? All right, now, Harley, I can answer yes, but I'd have to back up and admit that uh, I didn't know until just a few moments ago when Mr. Walter Selstead, the director of research here at Ampex, explained it to me. Uh, Mr. Selstead, in the first place, how much, how much of this magnetic tape would we have on one of these Ampex reels? Well, this size reel, Bob, has a mile and a half of tape. Mm -hmm. how, oh, that tape must be very thin, then. Approximately one and a half thousandths thick. I see, and how long would a, a full reel like this, how long would it play? Well, and at the speeds required for background music, it would take uh, about 12 hours reproduction. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a comparison of the number of phonograph records it would take to play that long alongside of one of these Ampex reels. Well, now, we still haven't got down to exactly what magnetic tape recording is and, and how it works, but fortunately, the people here at Ampex have worked out a very simplified explanation. So the next time somebody says to you, what's a magnetic tape recording, you can answer very glibly as follows. Well, the microphone here picks up the sound from the source in this particular case, the person speaking. The electrical impulses produced by the microphone are amplified by a suitable amplifier, which in turn is connected to what we call the recording head. Over this head passes the magnetic tape, and the magnetic recording head 
uh, arranges the magnetic particles on the tape in a magnetic pattern corresponding to the signal from the amplifier. The reproduction of this tape is accomplished by passing the same previously recorded tape over a similar magnetic head, and the magnetic head reproduces an electrical signal from the tape, which is amplified and is subsequently connected to a loudspeaker, which reproduces the sound. Well, actually, what you do there is, is reverse the process, then. That's correct, Bob. On this machine, you can see a similar arrangement, uh, only in the practical form, a supply of tape, a head assembly with erase, record, and playback heads, a capstan assembly, which pulls the tape across them, and a take-up supply reel here. The reproduction from the playback amplifier is reproduced by the speaker over here. You example. know, like so many of our modern wonders, I just can't help asking, it looks so simple and it's an accomplished fact now, but who ever thought of this in the first place? Well, a Dane by the name of Vladimir Polson in 1896 uh, first did magnetic recording. However, our success story is due primarily to the genius of our founder, Alexander M. Poniatoff, whose name uh, initials form part of the Ampex name. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part of Ampex history, too. You may have noticed that we've departed from our usual success story policy of outlining the background and history of the company. We'll fill you in on that later, but right now there's so many fantastic things that these amazing Ampex recorders can do that we wanted to bring as much of that as possible first. And the tear you will still my heart, I'll hide. By now, it's sound recording history that an ex-GI named Les Paul and his husky-voiced bride, Mary Ford, introduced within the past five years the most unusual development in the annals of popular music. How Les Paul, a fantastically gifted guitarist, could suddenly become an entire stringed orchestra, and how the single voice of Mary Ford could multiply to as many as an octet of her own intonations harmonizing intricately with each other was made possible by Ampex, magnetic tape recording equipment. How? Ladies and gentlemen, it seems almost superfluous to uh, introduce our very famous musical guest here tonight. Uh, if you haven't seen him or heard him in person or on television, you've certainly enjoyed his records. This is Clancy Hayes. Clancy, good to have you here. Bob, it's a pleasure to be here. I understand you're here uh, just kind of limbering up a little bit before you open at the Black Hawk. Yes, that's right. We'll be at the Black Hawk on July 8th. We just returned from a trip back to New York and Chicago, and uh, we'll be there on July the 8th. Well, now, earlier you told me that you were here and you were stacking a recording. Now, exactly how do you do that? Well, stacking, I guess you'd call uh, re-recording one on top of another, so to speak. Multiple, uh, multiple recording. See, I'm not a, an electronic engineer, and uh, I think you'd uh, be far better off if you'd ask Phil Gundy here, who did the job this afternoon, to explain how we did it. Fine, Clancy. Phil, I understand you've made a recording where you've got three Clancy Hayes singing and three Clancy Hayes playing the guitar all at one time. That's right, Bob, and uh, actually this is the same technique that we use uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford and other people that you, I'm sure you're familiar with. And we do it with two standard Ampex recorders. And actually, to uh, give you an idea of how to do this and how it was done here today, I think we'll ask Clancy to help us just to give a brief demonstration here, and then later we will actually play you the full tape that we recorded. All right, Clancy, the, the first thing that we did this afternoon was record on one of these standard recorders, uh, the tenor section. That's right. Okay? A few bars. I'm going to live on the River Nile. I'm going to live in excellent style. All right. Now, we have the tenor on this side, on this tape recorder. Uh, what we do then is play this back so Clancy can hear it, and at the same time, feed it into the second recorder. And then Clancy is singing the bass section, this time, the second. Okay, Clancy? I'm going to live on the River Nile. I'm going to live in excellent style. Bam. Well, that's it. Now, we have the tenor and the bass on that machine, on that tape. So we play back that tape so Clancy can hear it. And we feed it into this recorder again on another tape. And then he sings the lead melody. That way we have three voices all together on this machine when we get through. With Clancy singing his own harmony. Absolutely. I'm going to live on the River Nile. I'm going to live in excellent style. Well, now, this sort of a demonstration really doesn't give it to you. I think the best thing we can do is actually play this tape for you. Well, if One you don't, I won't believe it. Okay, here we go. Say, I'm going to live on the river Nile. I'm going to live in excellent style. Baboon butlers at every door. And in the diamonds on the floor. Going to marry that gal from Kalamazoo. My blood's going to change from red to blue. Entertaining royalty all the while in the castle on the river Nile. Well, Clancy, I think we've got a new show business sensation here. We'll bill you as the Hayes Brothers. Well, I feel like I had three heads <laughs> after listening to that one. <laughs> Fine, Clancy, thanks so much for being with us. And Phil, thank you very much for a very 
Interesting illustration of just how this is done. Fine, please. Now Harley Sater has something else to show us. Here's another example of the versatility of Ampex tape recording equipment. What you are seeing now is a familiar sight. A train coming into the station. And the sound, too, is familiar. Listen. Well, that's the sound of a train. If you'd closed your eyes, the sound would have had no direction to it. It would be flat, because it's recorded on a single track on this ordinary sound effect disc. Suppose it had been stereophonic sound in three dimensions. Chances are it would still have had no sense of direction to it, because the single loudspeaker in your set cannot reproduce 3D sound. And what is 3D Ampex tape recorded sound? Well, let's chart the course of that same train. Long before it arrived, Three separate microphones were placed at intervals of 30 feet along the railroad track. Each of these microphones fed into an Ampex tape recording machine located at a distance from the track. You remember the sound of the train approaching? The first microphone was open to pick it up and kept open as it increased. And then as it got closer, the sound picked up on the second microphone and mixed with the first. And as the train went past, the third microphone caught it moving to a stop beyond the station. Ladies and gentlemen, the sound picked up by those three microphones was played back to us on an Ampex recording tape with three separate tracks reproduced over three different loudspeakers that were each carrying sound from one of the three recorded tracks. We were astonished to find that with our eyes closed, we were actually able to follow the direction of that train from left to right without even seeing it. That is Ampex stereophonic sound. And it is this three-dimensional sound that is now adding such realism to the forward strides of motion pictures. You are viewing Success Story, an on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the San Francisco Bay Area, brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield. Tonight's Success Story is coming to you from the Redwood City plant of Ampex Corporation. Behind such a success story as this one of the Ampex Corporation, there has to be sheer genius in almost every department. The history of the corporation alone would support it. And to touch on that history and other factors, we join our Master of Ceremonies, Bob Day, with Mr. George I. Long, President, Standing, and Alexander M. Ponyatov, Founder and Chairman of the Board of Ampex. <laughs> well, Mr. Long, it actually seems incredible to me that Ampex has only existed since 1947. Well, Bob, we made our first tape recorder back in 1948. So as a manufacturer of this type of equipment, uh, we've been in operation just eight years. But there have been eight very exciting years. And Alex, as the founder of Ampex, I would like to ask you, uh, what during this eight-year period has given you your greatest satisfaction? Now, to me, the greatest satisfaction is our contribution to the defense effort. Secondly, Recently, in Washington, I visited the headquarters of Voice of America. It was a thrill. To cover the world, I have to use 38 different languages. On a worldwide basis, they are using 120 Ampex machines. One member kindly made this remark. Ampex is a link between truth of America and cringing people behind iron and bamboo curtains. Thank you very much, Mr. Ponyatov. It's, it's not at all surprising that this made you feel proud. Now, Mr. Long, uh, an exciting point in any success story is, is how it started. How did Ampex get into this, this new field? Well, Bob, that's kind of a long story, but perhaps this part of it might be of interest. Uh, back in 1948, when the boys at Ampex completed their very first machine, 
They piled it in the car of one of the engineers and uh, drove to Los Angeles with it for an interview with Bing Crosby. After Bing had, uh, had heard the machine, he was obviously very much impressed, and the following day or so, Mr. Basil Grillo, who was Bing's uh, business manager, came to the company's plant. Mr. Grillo said, uh, Bing liked that machine very much. He said, how do I go about getting one for him? The boys at Ampex uh, put their heads together a bit and sharpened their pencil and said, well, uh, one of those machines cost $4,000. Furthermore, uh, we'd have to have a, a, a purchase order for at least 20 machines, and that's $80,000. And then we'd need to have a check for $60,000 accompanying the purchase order. Basswold said, well, uh, uh, those are kind of rough terms, aren't they? But uh, Bing wants one of those machines, and if those are the terms, uh, here's an order for 20 machines, and uh, here's a check for $60,000. Well, it seems to me that Bing put a tremendous amount of confidence in a new company with a relatively new product. Well, he, he did that, and perhaps even more significant, Bob, is the fact that when Ampex delivered those machines to Bing, they worked beautifully. And Bing was able to place those machines in the uh, leading uh, radio stations throughout the country, where they're in operation today. As a matter of fact, the station over which this program is being broadcast, KGO, has a room filled with uh, Ampex tape recorders. And they don't refer to that as the tape recording room. They refer to that as the Ampex room. I know that's true, Mr. Long, and the growth of Ampex since then is a matter of record, but, uh, sir, to what do you attribute this, this remarkable growth? Well, uh, people, Bob, it's people. It's, and Ampex has many wonderful people, and it's their enthusiasm and their willingness to work together that, is a, that accounts for the growth at Ampex. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Long. You too, Mr. Ponyatov, for a, a wonderful background to a very thrilling success story. We've heard a great deal about the mystery of magnetic recording tape and what it can do. Actually, for all of its manifold possibilities, it can do nothing without this. For this is not only the heart of Ampex quality tape recording, it is also the head, or to be exact, the three heads. One for erasing, one for recording, and one for reproducing the sound. Undoubtedly, the most vital and critical factors in the story of tape recording. They must be made more precise than the most expensive watches. Here in this large department of one of Redwood City Ampex plants, the heads are produced. Let's get a close-up of some of the steps. It's woman's work, extremely precise and demanding in detail. To begin with, the heads are built up or laminated from thin segments of molypermaloid, a highly magnetic type of metal. For as you will recall, magnetic qualities are essential in rearranging the small particles of magnetic responsive metal on tape itself. Fragile shims or layers of binder material, a thermosetting plastic, are inserted between the laminations and will then be baked. Upon melting, this plastic binds the laminations together. Various types of heads require a different number of laminations for a variety of purposes. A black residue from the plastic remains after the head is baked. This is carefully scraped off, preparatory to the process called lapping. This lapping of the heads is jeweler's work indeed. Just as jewels are given their facets, this rotary wheel with a very fine abrasive powder and oil slowly grinds the back and the two recording tips of each head to exact tolerances. For if the surfaces, particularly where the halves are separated minutely, were to shelve, the quality of the recording would be affected or made impossible. After this first lapping, it is essential to line up the two halves to the precise same height and to make sure that the laminations on each exactly match up with the other. And once that's been accomplished, the winding of each separate half of head begins. According to the uses made of the various types of heads, copper wire, often as fine as human hair, forms the coils, while heavier varieties are employed in other types. The winding requires a great deal of human and mechanical precision. Then the individual heads are set in frames and a tiny shim is inserted between the halves to maintain proper width of the gap, an all-important step because it is actually this gap between the halves in which the recording, reproducing or erasing function of the heads is controlled. Now the separate heads are ready to undergo their initial testing to determine their electrical characteristics. In other words, whether or not they'll measure up to Ampex recording standards once they're in use. The equipment employed in the tests can accurately reflect the minute characteristics of each head. Finally, the separate heads undergo another lapping sequence in which the ultimate smoothness reflected by this luster 
over which the tape must pass is given them. Beyond that point, they're tested for performance characteristics, and if approved, proceed to final assembly. Speaking of assembly, Hartley, I've asked Mr. Charlie Anderson, the general foreman here, to give us a tour down this line at which the so-called wire harnesses for the Ampex tape recurs are put together. And, uh, Charlie, the first thing that strikes me is the, the brilliant colors of the wires that go into them. Yes, we have the colors, Bob. They're here for a reason. We use them to later on identify where the girl will solder and where she'll put these wires. Now, what she's doing there looks almost like a children's pegboard game. It sure is, and that's why we there is a routing sheet that tells you just where to put, she, put each wire as we go through the nails and through the wire springs. Now, this girl, the second girl here, is lacing up the harness, the one that she's almost finished with, and the third girl here is just finishing the harness. If you can take a good look at that, that's our harness, and we're through with it. Now, that will eventually go into an Ampex recorder. How many feet of wire are in there? There's roughly 100 to 200 feet in an average harness that we make. Well, tell me this, Charlie. How many hands will one of these Ampex recorders go through before it's completed? Uh, approximately 23 hands for the uh, Model 600. And what we can see here, those hands must represent a wide variety of skill. Now, are these the only two lines? Uh, no, we have uh, four lines in electronic assembly. There are two, uh, four lines here, two other ones, which you don't see in the mechanical department, which has two, and we have two specialized departments called short-run departments. Now, what's the device that's being uh, put together here? This is our Model 600 electronics. This is the girl uh, finishing up with an assembly here and wi do the, doing, the, doing the wiring here. Is this a, is this a part of the, uh, the little tape recorder, the one in the suitcase that we saw earlier? That is correct. That's our Model 600. And each of these young ladies along here are adding another part. This is a true assembly line operation. That is right. Each one has a different operation. We have method sheets that describe each operation to them. Here we have an assembly... Uh, inspection girl. She's inspecting the work that has previously gone on here. We put the quality in the machine at this point. We inspect it very carefully to see the work has been done right and correctly. Are there a number of other inspections on which this has to undergo? Yes, sir, there is, Bob. Down further along the line, you'll see this. Well, then, uh, a great part of your work is, is devoted to inspection to make sure that every bit, every piece is in exactly the right place and connected in the right way. That is right. That's what Ampex sells is quality, and that's what we put in the machines. And certainly, from what we've seen tonight, it pays off in performance. What's happening here? Uh, this girl is installing the tubes and the tube shields in the uh, last operation on the line here. And uh, she'll insert the tubes and the shields, and then we'll go on to the next station here, which I can show you what a completed unit looks like. That is a completed Model 600 that has gone through all these various 23 operations. Is this unit complete now? This is ready to work. That is right, except for this last station here, which we have a man who inspects it, checks it, uh, electrically to see if it's on curves, see that the thing meets the curve and the standards that Ampex sets on their equipment. Thank you very much, Charlie. Certainly this has been as impressive as the rest of our visit tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, certainly it's obvious that we could take hours, even days, to tell the whole story of the Ampex Recording Corporation. Perhaps I should say we should take years, because in the years to come, you and I and all the rest of us involved in these Richfield success stories will be seeing the developments of this chapter of Ampex. We'll be benefiting and enjoying from the great improvements they brought to our entertainment and our daily life. But the Ampex story is a young story. It's a success story of young men. We believe that it will remain young and that the true success factors in the story will not diminish it. We're proud to salute it as the most worthy chapter in our series. Success Story, an on-the-spot live telecast from selected locations in the greater San Francisco Bay Area, is brought to you each week as a public service by Richfield, makers of Rich Lube HD motor oil and Richfield gasoline. For every type of machine in every industry, there's a scientific Richfield lubricant. Next week, Success Story takes you for a refreshing visit to the spotless Coca-Cola bottling plant in Oakland, California. Until then... This is Hartley Sater saying good night from Richfield.